Hello and welcome to CDP Presents, our monthly webinar series. We are happy to have you with us today. And as always, if you've joined us before, welcome back. I am Dr. Jenna Ermold, Assistant Director of Training and Education at the Center for so Deployment Psychology at the Uniform Services University and part of our CDP Presents team. This project is sponsored by the Uniform Services University. However, the information or content and conclusions do not necessarily represent the official position or policy of, nor should any official endorsement be inferred on the part of the USU, the Department of Defense, or the US government. As always, I'd like to take a minute to uh, highlight some of our upcoming trainings that we hope might interest you. Uh, we have understanding and treating chronic pain coming up, that two-day EVP in, in just uh, a little bit on April 27th. Uh, if you're looking to work with military couples, please check out our military couples webinar series. Uh, we have uh, elements of assessment May 3rd. Uh, our CDP Presents, our webinar series uh, in May is going to be fantastic, which is psychological practice with transgender and gender non-conforming service members and veterans. So hopefully we'll see you next month for that. Um, and I won't read the rest of them, but we have a very busy training schedule coming up. Um, I'm really enjoying seeing everybody let us know where they're from. I know we've got everywhere from Canada to North Dakota, where there's a snowpocalypse, Georgia, Tucson, Arizona, I saw so welcome from, from across the uh, country and in, in other countries as well. If you missed last month's webinar, it was it was really great. CogSmart Compensatory Cognitive Training for Service Members and Veterans with Neuropsychiatric Conditions. You can feel free to check out the recording of that webinar on our website. And we have been talking about this for a, a few months now, but we are really excited next week to be able to offer our second annual evidence-based psychotherapy conference. Uh, registration is still open. This is making space for change, focusing on process and evidence-based treatments. So there is still time to register. Our keynote is Dr. Kirk Strassel. We have a fantastic lineup of some of the nation's uh, training experts on various um, topics. The conference is kind of a steal. Uh, it's only $20 and it includes seven CE credits. If you're interested in doing the two-day PMI workshops, uh, we're offering ACT, um, suicide prevention, and also prolonged exposure. ACT is full, but the other two are still open. So if you do the PMI workshop plus the conference, it's only 45 bucks for 21 CEs. Uh, so please, it's going to be fantastic. Uh, and we're going to put the link for the EBP conference in the chat. If you'd like to check that out, please, we hope you can join us. Also, just a shout out about our podcast, Practical for Your Practice. So this bi-weekly podcast features stories, ideas, support, and actionable intel to empower providers to keep working toward implementing EBPs with fidelity and effectiveness. Uh, so feel free to check that out as well. And thank you, Megan, for putting both of those links in the, in the chat. Uh, we hope you subscribe on your favorite platform. We're going to be launching season two in the next in the near future. In terms of enhancing your experience, many of you are Zoom mavens by now, uh, but before I introduce our speaker, just want to direct you to a few features. You may have entered the webinar in full screen mode. Uh, if you did, go ahead and click on your screen and hit escape. It just makes it a little more functional that way. We also recommend that you close all programs on your computer. Any difficulty viewing material during the presentation are likely due to a poor connection. While I'm speaking, it's a great time to check out the volume on your computer or device and adjust as needed. And we do recommend uh, using headphones if you're able to, to enhance your ability to hear. Many of you have already found the chat, which is great. Uh, you can find that by hovering over the bottom of your screen. This is a great place for you to ask any questions you might have uh, for the speaker, respond to questions that uh, he may pose or even or interact with each other. Uh, I will be moderating questions in the final 10 minutes of our presentation today. Also, if you're having any technical difficulty, go ahead and put that in the chat and someone from our support team will assist you. Please do note that you have the option to select everyone, that little blue box at the bottom. You want it selected to everyone so that everyone can see your uh, questions and comments uh, and that, that makes it easier to interact. 
This webinar series will be recorded and posted to the Center for Deployment Psychology's website, along with any additional materials and references and handouts for today's webinar can be found on your CE21 My Events page. Finally, at the end of our webinar, our project manager, Mr. Micah Norgard, will provide information and instructions on how to obtain your CEs. A reminder that in order to obtain your CE credit, you must attend the entire webinar and complete the webinar survey in CE21. Uh, we are offering American Psychological Association CE credits, which are acceptable to most state licensing boards for different mental health disciplines. So please make sure to check requirements for your state and retain any documentation associated with the training. And now, without any further ado, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce our speaker, who is Dr. Ken Ginsberg. Dr. Ginsberg practices adolescent medicine at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and is a professor of pediatrics. He directs health services at Covenant House, Pennsylvania, where he serves youth enduring homelessness. He directs the Center for Parent and Teen Communication and is the editor of the Multimedia Toolkit Reaching Teens, which offers youth serving professionals trauma sensitive strategies to promote positive youth development. Dr. Ginsburg has no financial interest to disclose. And with that, it is my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Ginsburg. Thank you so much. It is absolutely my pleasure to be with you today. Um, I've been working with uh, military families since 2006, and it's truly been one of the most uh, impactful and meaningful um, things that I have done in my career. Um, today, we're going to be talking for about an hour and 15 minutes about um, building resilience in young people. Um, this is a topic that I literally could talk about and do talk about for up to five days at a time. So I'm going to give you a whirlwind of um, how we think about resilience. Um, I also want to recognize that I'm speaking to some real experts here and that some of what I'm going to say is the stuff that you say, do, and practice every day. So for those of you who do, think of this as a model in how to translate this, um, these very complicated subjects um, for people to better understand them. With that said, let's begin. Look at this boy. Uh, he is the screensaver on my computer or was for eight years. Um, he has tremendous meaning to me. Um, look at his smile. Does that not kind of uh, tell you, uh, remind you why we do what we do? Do you see joy, possibility, right? So I have identical girls and only one of them had the crinkle between the eyes. Um, and it's the way I could tell them apart when they were running to me. So um, this kid really serves as a reminder of why I do what I do. And I was searching on the internet one day and truly I was captured by his smile. And then I saw the context. Um, this young man is on an Italian Navy boat because his refugee boat just sank. And I don't know what his life looked like in the first couple years in Northern Africa that made it so that his family um, was going to take the chance um, of getting on a rickety boat. But I know that they did it for in some way to make his life better. But I do know definitively what the last hour looked like in his life. I know. He was cold. He was wet. People thought they were going to die. There was screaming. There was terror. And yet this kid looks okay. So what is this really a picture of? What this really is, is the best picture I've ever seen of human resilience. Because it not only shows it in action when we look at the child, it tells us where it really comes from. And it comes from the adults who surround the child. So I'm not very good at math, but I count three adults. And one might be the father, one might be the grandmother or the, or the mother. But what it tells us also is that <clears throat> when parents are able to be there for young people, the rest of us are additive, but it's primarily the family. And then we become additive. When for one reason or another, the family is not able to be there, that's when we professionals become critical. So in the last about 10 to 15 years, the model that's really gotten the most attention in the world of um, helping youth to thrive, especially in difficult circumstances, is that of trauma-informed practice. And I'm very involved in this movement. Um, you'll see that I call it trauma-sensitive rather than informed because I don't care what you know, I care what you do. So with that said, I want you to understand that this model has backfired. I am blessed to work with lots of um, 
organizations that have moved towards uh, being trauma-informed. And what I will often see is that when the trauma-informed movement comes into an agency, the agency begins falling apart. Why is that? Because when you become trauma-informed, you should become more empathetic. You should understand that kids have different capabilities. Um, and you should perhaps give kids extra chances. But what happens is that the folks who have been trained in positive youth development begin clashing because they see it as... Um, lowering your expectations on young people. That when you're deeply empathetic and you give a second, third, and fifth chance, you lower your expectations. So I agree to a large extent. Um, the truth is that if we lower our expectations on people who have had the hardest lives, then we become one more chain in the link of oppression. So what do we need to do? We need to integrate models. We need to take all that we've learned from positive youth development, which means holding kids to high expectations always knowing how to build resilience, which is primarily what today's talk is about, being sensitive to their trauma and understand restorative practices, how to give a kid feedback by including rather than excluding them. We need a model that acknowledges pain, but that always sees the best in people. We need a model that recognizes the undermining forces of low expectations, but doesn't slap a new label on already marginalized communities. In contrast, our model has to recognize the inherent strengths of individuals, communities, and cultures. At the root of all models, if you put them all in a blender, what they're all saying is that the, the power of primacy of human relationships is what builds strong, successful youth and what heals those who have endured hardships. So we seek the sweet spot. This paragraph, which is the essence of reaching teens, which is a toolkit I produced, this, in this paragraph, you should see no jargon, right? But you should also be able to look at it and see positive youth development, see restorative practices, see resilience building strategies, and see trauma sensitive practices in this paragraph. Here's what we know. We know that young people need safe, secure, and sustained relationships to thrive. We even know that such relationships can allow them to heal from hard pasts. But at the same time, we have to guide them so that they're accountable to being their very best selves. And when we do that, they have to know that our high expectations are rooted in our caring. And ideally, our efforts at accountability should enhance rather than disrupt our productive and protective relationships. That puts all the models together. So what can we do to build resilience, to build youth, for, with all adolescents, but especially for those who've had the hardest lives. This is the puzzle. I use this puzzle a lot. It's the who am I puzzle, which is the identity formation question of adolescents. And what we have to understand, and by the way, I'm now quoting basically or adapting um, uh, the work. I'm blanking on the name right now because that's what happens when you're 60, but it'll come back to me. Um, um, and um, uh, what we want to do here is that we want to understand how neural pathways are created. And what we have to understand is that when we are a baby, um, we make a noise. And Bruce Perry, boop, 60 year old brain popping back. Um, so Bruce Perry, the model talks about how our brains are developed. And so when we are an infant, we will um, have a need. And when we have a need, we will make a noise. And when we make a noise, our mother recognizes that as the need for nurturance or nourishment. And she takes out a bottle and she meets our needs. And when that happens over and over again, the neural pathways in our brain get developed between saying, I have a need and my need is met. And I begin looking at the world as safe, secure, and predictable. But suppose my mother didn't recognize that utterance as a call for nourishment or nurturance. Then what do I do? Then I cry. And if that happens over and over again, my neural pathways get developed in such a way that says I have to be really emotional to get any intelligence, to get any, um, excuse me, um, any uh, attention. 
Suppose I still don't get my attention at that point. Then what do I do next? I scream. And then what happens is my neural pathways get laid down. When it happens over and over again, I get these shortcuts in my brain. So I don't have to think. I just go from an experience to the next point. That's what neural pathways do. They're shortcuts. They're super highways. My super highway gets laid down that says, in order to get what I need, I need to react. I need to scream. And suppose I still don't get my needs met. Suppose my world is dangerous and unpredictable. Then what happens is I am always looking for danger and I'm never feeling secure. And my neural pathways say, I will not get what I need no matter what. So I need to self-stimulate. So this is what happens in infancy and is reinforced through childhood. And we know adolescents who fall into all of these categories. Kids who believe that the world is safe and predictable. Kids who believe they need to be highly emotional. Kids who learn they need to be hypervigilant and hyperreactive. And kids who give up. Here is what is amazing about adolescence. Adolescence is a time of astounding brain development. right? And you can reshape and remold the brain only when you have a repeated experience. It can't be an attaboy, the world is secure. It has to be a repeated experience. So what do we do? We do the opposite of what young people have learned. If young people have learned that their emotions are denied or ignored, and if the only way they can get any attention is to be highly emotional or to scream, what do we do? We elevate, we celebrate emotions in advance. So the kids learn the language of emotional intelligence and they learn that they can express themselves. If kids have learned that the world is not safe or predictable, we double down on safety. We make it so that that young person will feel secure in our presence. This is what we try to do at Covenant House. And when we do that over and over again, the young people will begin to heal and their brain pathways can actually be changed during this astounding period of development that we call adolescence. <clears throat> so there's a tremendous amount of power that we have during this amazing developmental opportunity. And then what happens? When we work with some of the kids who have had the hardest lives and whose brain pathways have said that I need to be safe I need to be vigilant, then what happens is that the parts of their brains that are about hypervigilance actually remain brilliant because they, that, those parts of their brain are brilliant as a matter of survival. They remain brilliant, but what happens? They don't need to be activated. They don't need to be activated because there is no danger. We've created safety. What happens to this emotional brilliance? this protective nature, we find the most compassionate human beings on earth. And that's why I'm blessed to do the work that I do. Because when people who have needed to learn to protect themselves are able to feel safe, it's as if they have protection to spare, which we could define as empathy and human compassion. It is amazing to bear witness to. So let's talk about brain development. We talked about it a bit, but let's talk about it just what you need to know as a communicator and what you can teach parents and colleagues. So the, let's get some vocabulary down. When we talk about gray matter, we're talking about the nerve cells. Those are the cells themselves. When we're talking about white matter, that's those neural pathways, right? They're connections between nerve cells. And what happens is they're white because they're insulated. They're insulated with a substance called myelin, which happens to be white. And that means that um, that creates speed and efficiency. So if two nerve cells are from here to here, and now you've created white matter between them, their connections get myelinated, the messages go very, very quickly. It's about efficiency. Um, neural pathways, as I've said, are connections between parts of the brain. So a way a translational model is to think of it this way. Babies already have neural connections, right? But they're pretty inefficient, kind of like gravelly roads. You can get there, but it's bumpy, it's inefficient, it's windy. There might be some potholes, but you can get there. What is development? 
Development is about increasing white matter. It's about setting down those neural pathways or what I'm gonna call superhighways to get information across. Well, where do superhighways get built? Between the towns. You don't randomly have superhighways. You have them built between the towns. Next, dopamine. That's a feel-good brain chemical that offers you rewards. When your dopamine, when your reward centers, which is parts of your brain that encourage a certain behavior, when they get happy, dopamine goes off and you just want to do it more. So for example, adolescents have reward centers that say, whenever I'm with peers, my brain goes, eh, right? That's the dopamine going off and it encourages them to continue to have peer relationships, which is what's supposed to happen during adolescence because this is ultimately, they have to move from their original family to form their own. This is how we get grandchildren, right? It's driven by reward centers in our brain that have dopamine um, uh, within it. Um, next, the superhighways get built between the towns, as I've said. Reward centers encourage the towns to get built in certain places. But here's the thing you need to know. Experiences, for better or worse, also lay down towns. So when an experience is good and warmth and nurturance or education, you get a neural pathway laid down. But when it's abuse or neglect, you also get a neural pathway laid down. And where the connections are made to you, whether you're safe or secure or always worried, hypervigilant, is directly related to your experiences. The prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that's most involved with cognition, thinking, reasoning, planning. The amygdala is the part of the brain that's critical to emotional responses. As I've said, if you've had a hard life, your amygdala is brilliant, right? What happens during adolescence? You have pruning, meaning that some of your neural pathways will get um, cut away. In other words, if you have super highways, you don't want the cars to get confused and go off on the gravelly roads. So you block them off. That's what pruning is. Um, then, as I've said, the brain is very plastic. The brain can change and reshape itself for better or worse to adapt to its environment. And this is key to development. And again and again and again, we have to scream from the rooftops that adolescence is a time of astoundingly rapid brain growth where brains remain plastic. Everybody knows that the emotional centers develop first, but that has been misunderstood by so many folks as kids are all engine, no brakes, or any other phrase they think is cute, but that really hurts kids. Yes, the emotional centers do develop first. And this makes a lot of sense because during adolescence, your bodies are changing. You're becoming adult size. You're beginning to um, uh, have people be interested in you in various ways. You have to quickly be able to determine who's safe, who's not, who's worth trusting, who's not. You need to know that before you know algebra. So it makes lots of sense that your emotional centers are developed first. But development is a process, not an event. Yeah, the brain is developing until you're 25, but it's not like the 24-year-old is the same as the 14-year-old. It is a process. Here's the clincher for communication. Reasoning ability always exists, but it's solidifying. The biggest mistake you can make in, in, in thinking about adolescence is that they don't have the ability to reason. They do. The question is, which part of the brain are we turning on? What's the wrong way to see it? Why do most 16 year olds drive like they're missing a part of the brain? They are, that's an all state ad. Full disclosure, I was a state farm consultant. So I was kind of not gonna like this ad maybe no matter what, but the state farm ads during brain science were all about bringing families together. This implies kids are inherently broken. I have a really serious problem with this. What's the right way to see it? That adolescence is a critically important opportunity to shape the future. It is a time, here's the language I want us to begin using, and please begin speaking this language. I'm gonna give you a site where all of this language is used later. Adolescents are super learners. There's never gonna be another time in your lifespan where you will learn as much. Experimentation is a necessity, but it's our job to create enriching, exciting, safe opportunities for our natural explorers to grow. But it's also our job to protect kids from harm. So if again, this puzzle, 
Why do super learners have to push the edges? Why do they need to experiment? Because the reward centers in their brain go mm, whenever they have new knowledge. Where is new knowledge? It is at the edges of existing knowledge. Kids should be pushing. What's our role? Our role is to have very clear boundaries beyond which kids cannot stray. That actually makes them feel safer. If they're delivered well, kids do not resent them. They actually appreciate them because they know how far they can push. What's the, our other role? Our other role is to create golden opportunities at the edges of existing knowledge. When we make school exciting, extracurricular activities exciting, community engagement exciting, then kids do not need, they're natural explorers and they are satisfied at the edges within safe boundaries. Hear me clearly. Adolescents are natural experimenters. They are not inherently risky. Believing that they are inherently risky is dangerous, all right? Risk occurs when the adults that surround the kids are not doing the job of creating safe boundaries, and enriching opportunities. Next, how do we talk to a kid? If we understand that the emotional part of the brain is utterly brilliant and that the reasoning part of the brain is also developing but lags a little bit behind, we have to be strategic in which part of the brain we're talking to. The emotional part of the brain is so brilliant that once it's stimulated, it dominates and you can't get the rational brain to think. So it's a matter of how we talk. Are we going to use what's called hot versus cold communication? Just for you to know, cold communication is anything but cold. It's actually deeply warm. But hot communication is what turns on the emotional centers of the brain. It's condescending. It's anger. It's the lecture, which says, don't you understand that I know what's wrong with you? And you're going to die if you, if you don't listen to what I'm saying? Right? When we turn on the emotional parts of the brain, it hijacks the rational part of the brain. On the other hand, when we, when we remain calm, we understand that kids have an inherent intelligence and we talk to them in a way that allows them to figure things out a step at a time. We understand that they're experts in their own lives. Being experts in their own lives doesn't mean they know more than the adults. What it means is that they understand the worlds they navigate and that no plan can be put into place without including them because only they know what they navigate. So when we use cold communication, we're warm, we're caring, we're calm, we're co-regulators, which we're gonna talk about again later. Kids, once they're in mid-adolescence, can be every bit as rational as adults. This is the next thing that we need to scream from the rooftops. Adults who know how to communicate with adolescents can go much further with the adolescent. Resilience. Resilience is about the ability to overcome adversity. It's about bouncing back, right? But I think it's more than survival. Like you can read a lot of the literature and only talks about resilience in the context of survival. I think it's so much more than that. It's also because if you know how to um, survive, you also know how to thrive in the best of times. And that is our goal. Um, so resilience is partly a mindset. You know, I know that a lot, especially of people involved in the military, when they think about resilience, the resilience model that comes from Marty Seligman and the positive psychology group, which is also at Penn, right? They think of it primarily as a mindset. It's only a piece of it. But to understand this, we have to understand that we are wired, we are designed to be able to survive predators. So whether it's a tiger or a wolf or a bear, we are designed to be able to um, survive. If you don't believe me, imagine now you're in the jungle, you're just sitting down and you um, smell a tiger or a bear. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to jump, run, escape, and hide. So where do you need the blood if you're going to um, jump? You need it in your butt, which is your jumping muscle, and your legs, which are your running muscle. Where does it come from? It comes from your belly, because your belly stores about half your blood. And so what's the first thing you feel when you're stressed? The first thing you feel when you're stressed is um, butterflies. Why is that? Because that's literally the blood going from your belly to your butt so you can jump. <laughs> Tell me that's not cool, 
right? Then your heart beats fast. You sweat so you can cool off. Your pupils get big so you can jump over the log, even if it's dark out. You breathe fast to oxygenate that blood. But here's what's critical. You can't think because you're not supposed to turn to the tiger and go, hey, I'd like, to, um, um, uh, I'd like to work this out with you. And you know what else you can't do? You can't feel. Why is that? Because you're not supposed to be running from the tiger and say, I just want to understand your viewpoint. So hear this. During times of maximal stress, when you believe that a tiger is chasing you, not only does your body feel awful because you're primarily driven by adrenaline and the blood is in all the wrong places, but you can't think and you can't feel, which are your primary ways to be able to heal and to get out of a situation. So don't be surprised later when I talk about the mindset of resilience beginning with understanding what's a real tiger and what's not. If it's a real tiger, run. If it's a B plus on an exam, if it's something, if it's a fight you had with your mother, rethink what the real problem is. Now, the tiger is actually not the scariest thing in humanity. It's not the thing that creates the most physical or psychological damage. The thing that creates the most physical or psychological damage in the context of resilience is uncertainty, right? The tiger could be there, it could be there, it could be anywhere. Because you can't just run. You have to be ready to run at any minute. You have to be hyper vigilant, suspicious, and ready to jump. This is a completely different set of hormones. This is cortisol. It is cortisol that damages the body to chronic stress. It is cortisol that changes um, the way our brains are, um, uh, are, are wired. So look at this picture. This is actually a really cool picture. The tiger's right there in the middle, right? Where's the tiger now? Uncertainty is the greatest challenge for our sense of security. It's also a very dangerous time in humanity, which is what our nation is seeing right now. During times of uncertainty, people look for easy answers because uncertainty is uncomfortable, which makes it very easy to spread misinformation because human beings are very vulnerable during times of uncertainty because we're wired to be uncomfortable. So let's talk about the seven C's model of resilience. This is the American Academy of Pediatrics model. This is mine, but honestly, I borrowed the concepts from many of the great thinkers of resilience. The one I'd like to give a shout out for, because he's also so deeply connected in supporting military families is uh, Richard Lerner. So the first thing we need is confidence, right? If you don't have confidence, you're not gonna be resilient. Where does confidence come from? What it doesn't come from is just praise. Right. So think about how we we used to think that confidence was about having good self-esteem. And for about 20 years, we had this big self-esteem movement where kids just got so much praise and every kid felt like they were special as a butterfly, as unique as a snowflake. We applauded their every action. Look at you, Johnny, you're coming down the sliding board. Look at you. You're brave. You're smart. You can do it. I'm so proud of you. We never we forgot to give credit to gravity. Look at you, Johnny. It's all about you. What happened to this generation of kids? They were hyper anxious because they saw the world as surrounding around them and they didn't like being uncomfortable. They didn't like not having answers. Real confidence does not come from showering vapid praise or from a false notion of self-esteem. Real self-esteem comes from competencies. It comes from building skills in human beings and recognizing where they lack skills and, um, and uh, creating them um, to fill in those gaps. Human connection, I could say this over and over and over again, it is by far the most important element of resilience. Character, having an understanding of what is right and wrong. As Richard Lerner says, what would you do if no one was watching? That defines your character. Contribution. So contribution not only betters our community, it builds within us a sense of meaning and purpose. And meaning and purpose is undoubtedly one of the most protective um, things that um, human beings have. This is also what military families have at a very high level. And it might be one of the most protected forces within military families is that people have a sense of meaning and purpose. And as a result, they're connected with other people. But there's another reason why um, contribution matters so much. You know, your, your ultimate act of resilience is to turn to another human being and say, brother, I need a hand. It's the person who can reach 
is the person who's going to survive during the worst of times. The question is, what is it that enables you to reach? And what enables you to reach is feeling like there's no shame or pity on the other side. If you think there's shame or pity on the other side, you're not reaching. What does service give you? When you give service, you learn something. You learn that it feels good to give. And when you learn that it feels good to give, it means you can receive without shame. So raising our kids with a commitment to service actually not only protects them in the short run, it prepares them in the long run to deal with, um, God forbid, the worst of times. Coping. So here's the thing. We, um, uh, telling kids what not to do has never worked. We have to understand why kids do what they do. And virtually everything we fear, especially in adolescence, is about people trying to feel better, reaching for those quick, easy fixes. And the only way that we can help kids to be resilient is to build them in advance a wide repertoire of positive coping strategies. At the end of this talk, I'm going to give you a resource, a free resource, um, to allow your um, uh, kids that you serve to build their coping strategies. Control. I either believe that the world happens to me or I believe that I control my destiny. This is key to working with people who have endured trauma, is to give them a sense of control over a life that they've lost control over. It's also key to effective parenting. You'll do what I want. Why? Because I said so. Guarantees, not guarantees, but really makes it more likely that the kid will not tell you what's going on, engage in a lot of risk behaviors, and push you away. Whereas when we understand that we want to um, give kids increasing control of their lives while keeping them safe and monitoring them, why? Because we love them, kids learn to have self control. Resilience is not invulnerability. Guys, I've written textbooks on this stuff. Um, I've raised my own kids and I could move into your house and I couldn't make it so that people would be invulnerable, nor would I want them to be. When I look at my own life as a 60 year old, I've had the best life of anybody I know, right? Really productive, loving relationships. And I was essentially suicidal the whole year of 17. I never tried anything, but I thought about it all the time. Why? Because I had no framework to be able to understand the depth of my emotions, the complexity of my feelings, um, my hyperintuitiveness, all of this stuff that was the best stuff about me was the stuff I hated the most. So during adolescence, our goal is not to make kids invulnerable. Our kids, our goal is not to have them deny their emotions. Our goal is to have them learn to celebrate their emotions, to manage their emotions, and to leverage their emotions, and to help kids understand that sometimes that very sensitivity that creates so much pain during adolescence is exactly what predicts a magnificent adulthood. Resilience can be exhausting. Sometimes it is framed so positively. But when you talk to people who have had the hardest lives, they just say to you, do you have any idea how exhausting it is? Stop complimenting me for being strong. Do you know I want to stop being strong? I just want an easier life. So we have to be really careful about how we frame this. Resilience is not as simple as it seems when explained in an aspirational tone. In fact, the aspirational model itself can do a little bit of harm. So here's the bottom line. You know, young people are going to be more resilient when the important adults in their lives believe in them without condition and hold them to high expectations. Who should those important adults be? Those are your parents. And when they're there, the rest of us are additive or unnecessary. When they're not, we're critical. But what does unconditional belief mean? Is that like, um, uh, Trinity, um, uh, it's okay to do drugs, darling? No. It is um, saying that even when you do drugs, I'm not going anywhere. And holding you to high expectations, is that grades, trophies, or scores? No. The most protective force in a young life is to be seen, to be known, to be valued, to be understood. And to have the person who knows everything that's good about you also know your complexity and still love you. Why do we love? so that young people know they're worthy of being loved. It is the most protective force in a life. All of that is true. And young people do live up or down to the expectations we set for them. But this very aspirational model, we have to also talk about undermining forces. 
because they're undermining forces like systemic and structural racism, like bullying, things that are external to your family unit that can be barriers to thriving even, even for otherwise resilient youth. It's really important that we have our kids understand that because if they don't understand that and they hear only, I'm so lucky because I have a wonderful family, what happens when they have to confront these barriers? They're only gonna blame themselves. The kid who's bullied is gonna blame themselves. It's so important that we help people understand that the world can be complex um, and your family's gonna be supportive to you, but it can, there are, still are other undermining forces. Um, here is another thing that we should be screaming from the rooftops. You know, one way of looking at uh, resilience, you know, its limits is to call it depression. And I'll tell you that when kids look like adults who are depressed, we never miss those kids, right? I think if we just think wanted to like screen someone for depression, we would start with, are you sad, right? Um, and we would ask, you know, are you bathing? Are you um, eating enough? Are you sleeping too much? Not sleeping enough right? Those are the vegetative symptoms, but we would focus on sadness, but that's going to catch almost all adults, but only half of young people, because for adolescents, half of them are not experiencing sadness. They're experiencing rage or irritability. And then what happens is we call those kids bad instead of sad, and that is the root of the school to prison pipeline. Above all, it is human connection. You know, remember this, as individuals, we are fragile like a stick that can blow in the wind and ultimately break. Joined with just one other person, we become nearly immovable. Joined with several people, we become impenetrable. And for a reason that has something to do with physics and everything to do with spirituality, we are stronger together than we are as the sum of our individual parts. And what about shame and stigma and emotions? When we join together, then we understand that just as I am vulnerable, I can borrow someone else's strength and get through it. And if we follow this model, there's no shame in seeking help because we know it's only a matter of time before that person is vulnerable and we will lend them our strength, human connection. Let's talk about strength-based communication, about how to operationalize some of this. Strength-based communication is not about praise for the sake of praise. I talked about how that backfired when we talked about self-esteem. It's about listening. It's about hard listening until, until people's strengths are really revealed. It's about a kid knowing you're on their team. It's about highlighting and elevating their strengths and facilitating their recognition and celebration of their strengths. It's about planting seeds. And what do I mean by, oh, and strength-based communication is essential to promoting positive behavioral changes, right? So here, this is in one minute what I think can make a difference with positioning you to save someone's life. Remember this, behavioral change is not an event. Boom. It is forward movement, backward movement, forward movement, backward movement, forward movement, backward movement. If you ask kids, especially kids who have had hard lives, what they want more than anything from people, what they will tell you is, I want someone who has my back. What does that mean? Most of us, most adults in young lives are cheerleaders. Look at you. Look at you coming down the sliding board. Dr. Ken, I got straight A's. Um, I'm so proud of you. You want to be a lawyer when you get older and you're really good in school and you want to help people and work for justice. I'm proud of you. You can do it. What's going to happen when that kid gets straight A's again? You're going to know it. They're going to call you and you're going to applaud again. What happens the next semester when they get straight A's? What happens when their dad dies and their mom become or goes to prison and their mom becomes um, really, really depressed? And suddenly that young person now becomes the mother and father in the home and is taking care of the three little siblings, waking up at five in the morning to make sure they eat doing prayers with them, doing homework with them, not beginning their own homework until 11, getting only four hours sleep and falling asleep in class. And then the teacher says, what are you even coming to school for if you don't care enough to stay awake? Now they're getting C's and D's. Will you know? And the answer is you won't. Why? Look at you, you're getting straight A's. The relationship is predicated on forward movement. You have their front, 
but you don't have their back and they're not going to want to disappoint you because they care so much about you and about how you think them. Let's just shift the praise a little bit. Dr. Ken, I got straight A's. I love that you always include me in your life. I love that I know what's going on. I love that you trust me, that you share things. Come up with 10 different ways to say it, but applaud the relationship. And then when the kids um, has a problem, they will come to you because they know that it's the relationship that matters to you. This positions us to save lives in ways that praise doesn't. Now let's talk about behavioral change in general. It's a process, not an event. There are several steps to behavioral change. First, people have to become aware. Then they have to get motivation to want to change. Motivation itself doesn't do anything unless you have the skills. Then you put into place the balancing act of trying out the new skills, and you're only going to move forward if you believe that the new skills um, are working for you. And you're only going to maintain your new behavior if people around you expect you to. So I want to be a virgin until I'm married. What's going to happen when I turn on the TV set um, or go on YouTube? What look? What does that look like? Kids like me who choose to um, uh, wait until marriage, right? What are my friends going to say? It's only when we change the environment that kids can begin to um, maintain their behaviors. There's another concept of behavioral change. Um, by the way, this is why at nearing the end of my career, I'm working on changing the cultural narrative about youth. Not the talk I'm giving you today, but it's about what my next book is about. And it's about um, just changing the way we see kids. Because when we see kids as broken and as risky and as thinking they're invincible, none of those things are true. But when we um, see kids that way, kids don't maintain positive behaviors because they don't think they're expected to. In any event, there's another concept in behavioral change, which is pre-contemplation. We talk about it all the time. And in English, it means, gosh, you haven't thought about it yet. So you go back to this other model and you go, well, gosh, if the person's in pre-contemplation, they lack awareness. Let's throw some facts at this kid. And then we throw some facts at the kid in believing that that's going to get them past pre-contemplation. But that wasn't the problem. So you're wasting your time, right? It's really about building their confidence and understanding that shame and demoralization is what prevents action. So our goal is to find competence in people's lives and therefore build their confidence. That's what moves them past pre-contemplation. So here's the field of young lives. And this kid is um, smoking marijuana, devastating to brain development, right? And this kid is um, selling drugs, devastating to the community. This kid wants to become pregnant. She's only 15 years old. That's going to create intergenerational poverty. So we throw some facts at those kids. So let's look at that six-year-old smoking marijuana. We say to him, young man, do you not understand that marijuana will fry your brain, make you grow breasts and shrink you down there? All of which, incidentally, is true-ish, right? But how does he respond to that information? It's, thanks, Doc. He smokes some more. Why? Because we forgot to ask why he was smoking in the first place. And if we had, he would have explained to you that it was to help him chill. And you're telling him where he was going to grow and shrink didn't help him chill. So it only stressed him out. He's going to go and he's going to go right back to that drug. What are we going to do instead? We are going to listen for his behaviorally operational strengths. We are going to listen hard. We are not going to listen for friendliness. We're listening for those skills he has or those attributes he has that suggest that he has the roots of change and the roots of progress within him. We are listening for resilience in a life that would have destroyed you. We're listening for insight um, beyond his years, compassion beyond measure, his desire to help um, other people. In this kid who's smoking marijuana, who's trying to chill, that's a kid masking his sensitivity, his compassion. When we catch that and elevate that, then what happens is we build on his strengths and overtake the field of risk. So it's not about vapid praise. It's about love. By the way, I don't use the word love with kids because that can be creepy. Just because in English, um, caritas, the love of humanity, 
is is the same word as 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 sexual love so we don't want to have any confusion here but what is love love is seeing someone as they deserve to be seen as they really are not through the lens of the behaviors they sometimes needed to display so we are listening and we are listening hard so that we can see all that is good and right let's go back in the beginning we were Agape, absolutely, for the person who just said that. So that's another form of love, religious or spiritual love, chesed, mechaba, all of these different kinds of love. And if we spoke different languages, then we could use the word love, right? But we don't. Um, and the other point I want to make about love, love is not liking. You don't have to like. There's a lot of people I don't like. Liking is subjective. Love is something we can do through active listening. Next, remember we're trying to have a secure relationship. Right. So what does that mean? That that could mean that the person is not going anywhere. So hopefully you have a secure relationship with your mom. But you know what? I can be an awesome doctor and you're still not going to have a secure relationship with me because in the best case scenario, I'm going to see you, um, you know, once a month if, if, if you really have a lot of issues going on. So what's more important is that we make sure the young people are not reliant on our presence. So what do we do? Why else is this model so incredibly important? Because when we listen to all that is good and right about a human being, we are giving them their ruby slippers. In other words, helping them understand that they have the seeds of success within them, right? Um, uh, just as Dorothy thought that it was going to be like the scarecrow or the wizard himself, but at the end, she realized that she always had it. When we use strength-based communication to help kids understand all that is good and right in them, what they possess, what their strengths are, we're giving them their ruby slippers. And as a result, they walk away from us with the intervention continuing rather than being reliant on us. Next, if you do this kind of strength-based stuff, get used to people telling you you're the best counselor they ever had, the best teacher they ever had, the best doctor they ever had. It feels good. And when you hear that, do a happy dance inside, but outside, hold up the mirror and go, hey man, the only reason that uh, I was able to say any of this is because you chose to share yourself with me. This is about you, not me, right? Because they need to walk away knowing they have the power. Let's talk now about giving kids control over their decisions, which is a vital C, um, but it's all it's really critical, especially in the context of recovery from trauma. Um, literally, every time we offer choices rather than dictates, we're doing that. All right. But I'm going to give you some fancier ways of thinking about this. Right. So we want to offer radical calmness, even amidst the chaotic reality, as a first step to helping youth access their thinking powers and compassionate natures. Right. Remember um, that um, we are trying to speak to the cerebral cortex rather than the amygdala. Remember that when the amygdala is quieted, the protective nature of that brain is able to access compassion. Right. So this is about co-regulation. So how do you define co-regulation best? You're on a plane. There's turbulence. And. Um, who do you look at? Do you look at the guy next to you who's holding on tight? No, you, you look at the flight attendants. And if they're still serving snack mix, you're chill, right? That's what co-regulation is. It's borrowing other people's emotions. This is amygdala to amygdala communication. This is actually mostly communication that we do. It's mostly through body language and subtle signals that we barely understand that we're sending, but that we can learn to send. It is key to de-escalation. You know, I work in crisis centers um, it's key to de-escalation. De it's critical to anticipating problems, right? It's not just about de-escalation. De it's about actually just being able to check in beforehand and seeing when kids are smooth. Some of the organizations I work with, kids will begin their day as they walk in with the adults, just giving a hand signal, one to five. One, I'm having a really bad day. Watch out for me. Five, I'm cool, right? Um, anticipate. Um, I, I keep wanting to remove this bullet and, and I just... No, so I had an 18 year old kid who I asked him to, at the sad covenant house, and I asked him to describe himself. And he said, you know, I like to think of myself as like Mother Teresa, but you know, with an anger problem. <laughs> That's literally who my kids are. And it's when we are radically calm that we see the Mother Teresa. And when we co-regulate, that is when we allow um, kids to develop their skills. So 
If you have a five-year-old in your own home, um, you want to look like this duck, right? Just gliding on the water. Things are cool. That's what co-regulation is, right? Life is tough, but I don't have to worry about it because look, at, there's my mom and she's just swimming happily. But if you have a teenager or if you work in a crisis center and you look at this duck, you don't look real. They can't imagine thinking like this. So what do we want to do for our kids when we um, uh, is we want to look more real? We want to look like this duck right? We're still floating on the water, but it's only because our little feet are underneath paddling like crazy when we show kids how we paddle. When you, we show young people what we do to stay afloat, that's where the magic is. We also have to learn how not to undermine co competence. We've got to talk in a way that young people understand. We've got to teach more people about development and help more people understand that you, Young kids and all people in crisis go concrete, meaning they think, think they see things exactly as they are. And when they get older and they stay calm, they can think abstractly, meaning they can look into the future. They can think about nuance. It means we've got to stop lecturing kids because lecturing kids is inherently abstract and it's really hot, really hot. Don't you know that what you're doing right now, which I'm going to call behavior A, could easily lead to consequence B. I never imagined my little boy doing consequence B. Now I wonder what's between your ears. If consequence B happens, you're more than likely to go on a consequence C, which is a slippery slope down to consequence D, and which never would have happened if you didn't begin hanging out with Eric, whose own mother doesn't like him, and you're letting him influence you. Consequence E happens, you're more than likely to go on a consequence F, slippery slope to consequence G. Look at me, young man, when I'm talking to you. This isn't for my own good. If consequence G happens, you're going to go into consequence H, which could lead to consequence I. And do you know what happens if consequence I happens? You die. That's what happens. And what does the kid hear? Womp, 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 womp. Die. Why? Hot communication, all amygdala, so you can't think. Abstract thought. The mathematical structure of a lecture looks like this. A goes to B. There are all sorts of intervening variables that I can't understand that make a difference to the outcome. It's about talking to kids differently. Calm cold communication and teaching how to um, change the mathematical structure to, huh, I was um, thinking of that you're doing behavior A now, but I want to tell you that I'm worried about that because that can go on to behavior B sometimes. Um, tell me, do you have any thoughts about making sure that behavior B doesn't happen? Yeah, what are you going to do? I listen, I listen, I listen until the kids at B. When they're at B safely and securely, I take them to C. When they're at C, I take them to D so that they get it, get it, got it, own it. Today is not that talk, but for those of you who've seen me before, I have lots of examples on um, really getting kids out of crisis using this kind of communication. Um, let's talk about parenting now. So I run the Center for Parent and Teen Communication. I'm gonna show you our resources later. But when we're talking about control, another way of looking at that is thinking about self-discipline. And I think one of the greatest you know, research-based things we can do as adults who work with families is move them towards balanced parenting. It's about balancing love, warmth, and monitoring. What's interesting love and warmth? Warmth is, um, love is what you feel. Warmth is if your kid knows you feel it. So if you feel it inside, and it's going to come up later, especially for military families, right? If you love your kid, but the kid doesn't know it, it doesn't count, right? So when we have, uh, when we're talking about parenting style, um, the, um, uh, there is, uh, on the one hand, love, warmth, and responsiveness. Responsiveness being fancy talk for flexibility, understanding development, and understanding that boundaries should expand, um, and monitoring rules and boundaries, when you do this, you got yourself um, four quadrants. And on the one hand, you got lots of rules, not a lot of warmth. This is your authoritarian parent. You'll do what I say. Why? Because I said so. Which letter in the word no do you not know how to spell? Um, that felt awful. Felt so awful that a lot of parents, oh, and how do those kids turn out? They're angels, absolute angels, until they stop being angels, which is mid-adolescence, right? Um, and then they engage in lots of risk behaviors and their parents have no idea. Um, uh, parents, a lot of parents went equal and opposite. Um, lots of warmth, not a lot of rules, permissive. Darling, I love you so much, you know. Um, I couldn't talk to my dad about a lot of things. It's why I wanted you to think of me more as a friend. Call me, Ken. Um, I'm gonna spend a lot of time with you. 
and uh, I'm going to let you make mistakes, but um, I trust you. Make your own choices. How do those kids turn out? Um, uh, these kids um, uh, become highly neurotic. They love their parents a lot, but they really worry about disappointing them. And they're controlled primarily by an emotional leash, um, which is not disappointing their friend. Um, the worst kind of parenting is no rules, no warmth. Kids will be kids, you know. I figured it out. They'll figure it out. Um, hell, if they burn down the barn, I'll get a fire hose. Um, disengaged parents. These kids, what are they going to do? They're going to burn down the barn. They're going to become delinquent. They'll do whatever they can to um, get their parents' attention. The correct kind of parenting, study after study after study, culture after culture after culture, is balanced parenting. Um, lots of rules and lots of warmth. Darn, I love you so much, but you know what? I'm not your friend, I'm your dad, and that's better for you. I'm going to let you make a lot of mistakes because that's how you learn. I'm going to stand by your side as you learn to stand back up. But for the things that really matter, and those are the things that involve your safety, or you're not being as good a human being as I know you could be, you're going to do what I say. That's balanced parenting. How do these kids turn out? They turn out, um, uh, they have the best, uh, they do best in school, lowest rates of anxiety and depression. Um, they are much less likely to um, do drugs, to have early initiation of sex. My own research, half is likely to be in a car crash. Half is likely to be in a car crash. Um, when they're kept, when you're raised in this kind of a home, uh, less likely to be bullied, less likely to be bullies. Um, I don't know if I said drugs, but also drugs like exposure to violence. It's really astounding, right? Um, here's what you have to be careful with when you're working with um, uh, different cultures and different communities: is uh, you can't define what are the hands on the stove moments. Um, so a lot of times. If you're living in a dangerous situation, you have to be what, what seems to be much more authoritarian. No, very quickly, just as with a two-year-old, you didn't let them put their hand on the stove. You didn't let them run into the street at three. You also can't let your kid get into a car with someone drunk. You also can't let a kid go out on the streets if there is um, a lot of violence on the streets. Um, what is key for those parents is to help them understand they're not being authoritarian if they're always being very clear that they're coming from a place of love. Darling, it's because I love you so much that you cannot go outside. My job is to protect you. If you do that, you're still a balanced parent and you would be what I would call a, um, uh, you're parenting with urgency, but you're still uh, parenting correctly. Um, effective monitoring. You know, you go back 10 years. Uh, yeah, I think 10 years. And you would um, ask, uh, it was all like parents, you're the anti-drug. Where you ask your kids where they're going, who they're going to be with, um, whether they're going to be people at home, uh, when they're going to be uh, back. The who, when, what, where's, why's the parenting. Uh, we don't do that anymore. And the reason we don't do that anymore is because we learned that kids lie when you ask them a lot of questions. So really, it's about being the kind of parent um, where your kid chooses to talk to you. Um, and uh, there are many um, uh, contributors to this. But the one I just want to point out right now is um, who are you going to talk to, right? Um, are you going to talk to, wait, wait, are you going to talk to the authoritarian parent down here, right? Are you going to talk to that person? No. Why? Because um, you already know what the answer is. No. How about the permissive parent and the parents who are trying to be friendly? They want to know everything, but you're not going to go to them for advice because you already know the answer. It's yes. How about the disengaged parent? You don't go to them because you uh, know that the answer is, I don't care. Um, who do you go to? You go to the parent who is balanced. Um, you go to the parent who um, gets involved only when it's a matter of safety um, or morality, because that's where kids want us involved. They don't want us in their personal lives, but the research from Judas Smetana, from Rochester, they want us involved when it's about safety or when it's about rules of society. So the balanced parents know the most. Um, now let's talk about stress management and resilience. It's about learning to cope in a positive way with life's inevitable stressors. And we might do our greatest good by equipping youth with a wide range of coping strategies. So yeah, this is coping, it's that C, but let's be clear um, that uh, kids who know how to cope can also gain control over their lives. Stress, incredibly uncomfortable. Got to do something about it. Doing something about it is called coping, right? And the problem, one of the real problems in humanity is that the negative coping strategies work best, right? These are your quick, easy fixes. Um, this is uh, uh, drugs. I mean, drugs are fantastic, except they happen to destroy your life. 
but in the second, they make you feel good. And the fact that they work so quickly is exactly why they're addictive, right? So the negative coping strategies do work, but they're deeply harmful. So what do we want to do? We want to make it so that when life is hard, um, you will naturally um, go to positive coping strategies, right? Um, and your box will be full of positive coping strategies so that that becomes your path of least resistance, which will ultimately lead to relief. What's the first thing you do? Stress, like when it's a real tiger coming at you, it's a real tiger coming at you. When it just feels like a tiger, um, then you should not um, bring out all of your stress hormones. That's where cognitive reframing is so important. And this is where the work of positive psychology, Marty Seligman, um, um, is you know just outstanding, as well as um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, very simplistically, because I'm a simple fella, um, uh, we can define the stressor with three questions. Hey, this thing, real tiger, paper tiger, which is it? Next. Reminding ourselves, th think about it. How many of you had grandmothers who said something to you like, um, always say to yourself, this too shall pass. That is really protective. And the next thing is um, knowing when good things are permanent. If you run a youth program, this is key. And this is where this begins tying together, right? If you run a youth program, you may have noticed that uh, kids do really well until they're about to age out. And then they just fall apart. They literally shoot themselves in the foot. Why is that? Because they believe that they're dependent on you. They don't have the ruby slippers, right? They don't believe they can walk away from the program. And if they can't walk away from the program, then what they're going to do is main control over, maintain control over their environment by um, shooting themselves in the foot. It's why this ruby slipper concept matters so much, right? It really matters. Um, for kids to understand that actually um, some good things can be permanent and they can take control. Um, more dialing down catastrophic thought, this is CBT on three sides, right? Um, recognize negative thoughts. Negative thoughts often begin with phrases like I better or if I don't or I should. Catch your thoughts. Stop. Pause. Evaluate them for accuracy. Develop more accurate explanations when difficult things happen. Take away self-blame and begin looking for external co causes. Um, Decatastrophize. Um, so let go of those harmful thoughts that you begin spinning and escalating um, that suggest that a mistake or a failure will lead to inevitable disaster. Um, uh, and what happens when we're talking to youth there are opportunities every day. Of course, there's formal CBT, but every day we can just talk to kids to learn how to catch their thoughts. But it means changing a little bit from um, uh, the um, way adults normally interact. We normally focus on what happened and then how do you feel or what are you going to do, right? Though that's what we do. And we're missing the opportunity to talk to kids hear the voices in their head, that those B connectors between what happened and the action, that silent self-talk, because it's that self-talk that drives your beliefs, determine how you're going to interpret something, and are going to make a difference between whether you're going to react calmly or not. Um, and um, another thing, if you, know, if you could just insert one, one cognitive behavioral word into people's vocabulary, it's the word yet. Because if you can just take what's in your brain and then like, I don't have any friends becomes, um, I, uh, I don't have any friends yet. I can't do calculus. I haven't learned how to do calculus yet. It just frees you from this catastrophic thinking. Um, so an effective stress management plan has to have some broad category. Categories to engage problems and um, it has to have uh, categories to disengage. If you don't teach people how to disengage from problems, they'll find drugs because drugs are a disengagement strategy. So don't do drugs doesn't work. Teaching people how to escape in healthy ways does work. Help, telling people how to manage their emotions is critical, but managing emotions is not the way to avoid drugs because drugs are, have a different purpose. It's to not think. So we have to teach kids how to work with emotions 
and how to get away from emotions sometimes. We have to teach them in general how to work with emotions and also how to solve problems. Because if you only help kids become emotionally intelligent, but you don't help them learn how to solve problems, then the problem's right there to bite them in the butt, you know, an hour or two later. Um, in the context of military families, um, I think it's important to think about some extra things with stress management. Um, the first is the language of love. You know, and this is particularly important. And God willing, this is changing as time goes on. But, um, and I hate separating things by gender. I think it's kind of always a mistake. But the truth is that lots and lots of men were not raised with the language of love. Um, uh, and yet we knew that we were loved. And it might have been, you know, the pat on the shoulder. It might have been throwing the ball. You know, we knew we were loved. Occasional hug, a squeeze around the neck. But there wasn't really a language. Um, and that's okay unless you're separated by distance. And if you're separated by distance, you can't squeeze someone's neck, which means that in the context of deployment, you have to have the language of love down. You have to be able to say, I love you and I care about you because all those body signals that define masculinity aren't going to work in the context of deployment. Another thing really important for military families is the don't spare me conversation. I think that military families at various times are under so much stress and kids know it and one or both parents are deployed. But if one parent is deployed, what does that mean? It means that the other parent has all these extra responsibilities and military kids can become adultified, as you know better than I. Um, they can become perfectionistic um, because they're adultified and they take on the adults, uh, the role of adults. And then what they might want to do is spare their parents. As a result, the parents aren't able to really engage fully in their lives. So it's really important that we have those don't spare me conversations with our kids. Darling, I love you so much. And I love the fact that you're trying to protect me. And uh, I think that that really tells me who you are as a human being. But when you're sparing me by not telling me what's going on in your life, then what happens is you're taking away the thing that actually I care about most, which is my ability to parent you. So I beg you to understand that. Um, sparing me is not protecting me, including me in your life. That's how to protect me in our relationship. That's the conversation that we need to have. Um, then the next piece, um, which I had done a lot of work on um, when deployment was really um, going full force, um, is maintaining connection even when separated by distance. Um, of course, things are much, much easier now with the internet and everything else, but there are other key issues, which is um, how do you discipline, right? Well, you don't want to discipline, which means to teach, not to punish or to control. If you're not involved in disciplining your kid, then you're not really involved in um, helping them to grow up. And the last thing that we want is to have a parent who's separated by deployment to um, uh, um, be the disciplinarian. Um, and instead, what we can do is we can really help families think in advance of what are the consequences to um, various actions. Um, and the family can sit down and create them before um, the um, deployment. And when that happens, then um, the parent is included in real time. You don't have to wait until you can talk where then they become the bad guy, um, which is the last thing we actually want for our um, deployed parents to feel like. Um, I'd like to, um, if, uh, uh, Micah, I'd love to be able to share this now. Um, I'm going to take you to the uh, Center for Parent and Teen Communication. This is a free resource um, that, um, okay, I have host disabled participant screen sharing, so I need to be able to share. And there we are. Um, so this is the uh, Center for Parent and Teen Communication. Um, and it is, uh, we do many, many things that have nothing to do with the website. We're really trying to change the way people think about um, kids. Um, when you think about adolescence, I think you very often um, think about um, survival guides. You know, most books I have a, over there are like all parenting books. The word survival is in the subtitle of half of them, which deeply offends me. Um, this is the opposite. This is about helping parents know how much they matter. 
Um, this website is absolutely free. It is deeply multicultural, not just by picture, but by inclusion. Um, and there are a couple things that I would like to point out to you. Um, so if you type in military, um, as you know, I've been, or as you may know, I've been deeply involved with military families for a long time. And um, if we go to this page, this is essentially a navigational page for military families where you will get um, what I believe are the key issues that military families need to know in the context of um, deployment, um, including managing stress, um, parenting style, um, the language of love, right? Um, and um, a, a discipline contract so that you can parent while you're apart. Um, and uh, the don't spare me conversation is all here. Um, a couple other things that I want to call your attention to. The whole website is useful. It's all, I mean, I think so. Um, it's uh, based on um, balanced parenting. Um, but under health and prevention, um, an article I really like under supporting emotional health is um, the um, helping teens um, uh, prepare for professional help. Um, because when we use the right strength-based language, young people know how helpful professionals can be. Um, and so this article walks parents through the language of how to get kids to understand the power of strength, right? Make it clear that it can work. Time invested will pay off. This is an act of strength. You're not gonna be alone. I'm not going away from you. This is what 17 year old me needed to hear. Strong feelings now lead to a strong adulthood later. That's I think really, really key. Um, privacy, et cetera. Under 14s, this is something you can use in your offices, again, absolutely free. This is uh, well-funded, which is why it's um, free. Um, build a teen stress management plan. Um, this is not high level. It doesn't replace counseling. But what it does um, is it helps teenagers to understand stress biology um, and uh, a basic stress management plan. Um, they could spend three hours on the site. Every one of these links goes to different films and different articles. Um, I can tell you from practical experience, this has been used by about 20,000 kids so far, um, and they don't. <laughs> they really just go right to the plan. They read this first page and they go right to the plan. Um, and in this plan, we will they will put in their name and their email. We are not collecting any data. This is only for their use or for your use in working with kids if you'd like. Um, but we take them through 11 pages where we help them in the whole repertoire of positive coping strategies, identifying and tackling the problem, thinking about why it's not a real threat, why it's necessary. So you can choose answers or you can type in your own. And, um, you know, here's the word yet. Um, from there, we're going to go into breaking mountains into hills, a really key strategy for problem focused. From there, avoidance, avoiding what stresses you out when you can. From there, how to conserve your energy. From there, the power, it's about um, body, power of exercise, the power of relaxation. Again, there are films that go with each of these sections. Um, eating well, sleeping well. Um, instant vacations. This is an emotion-focused avoidance strategy. In other words, drug prevention reading a book, right? But these are things where we give you ideas and if this was facilitated by an adult, it would be even better. Um, now it's about releasing emotions. And then we end with contribution um, to gain a sense of meaning and purpose in your life. Um, so I'd like to go back to um, not sharing the screen. Um, and okay, so stop share and here we are. So if I can, thank you so much. Um, so uh, let me just check one thing. So um, at the end of this talk and getting ready for some questions, um, I know that listening to me is like drinking from a fire hose, right? <laughs> because I really do do, um, you know, five day trainings. And, um, and I also know that listening to me can also be a bit exhausting, right? Because you already have so many things to do. And along comes this little man sitting sitting at a desk in Philadelphia saying, you gotta love the kids. And you're like, love, how can I add anything more to my plate? My plate is absolutely overflowing, right? How can you add something else to do? And the answer quite simply is, 
I haven't added anything to your plate. Really, really think about what I've attempted to teach you in the last hour and 10 minutes. And I think if you reflect, you're going to learn that I actually didn't teach you very much. I actually reinforced what you already knew. And when we're talking about love and we're talking about relationships being the core, we're not adding anything to your plate. We're talking about the plate. There's literally no program that works without this, the essence of human connection and protection, the scaffolding upon which all other programs rest and which young people thrive. So with that said, that gives us uh, 12 minutes for questions and I'm gonna, I'm um, happy, happy to take them. Excellent. Well, I don't know if you were tracking the uh, amazing amount of positive and, and appreciative comments that were coming in while you talked, but this was definitely an incredibly well-received presentation, so thank you. Um, and I would love for people to continue to put some questions in the chat. I know that um, one, one question that came up that was really something that's been on my mind is, um, and I've been a fan of the seven C's model for a long time, maybe just speak to challenges you've seen or shifts and challenges even with technology and, and kids, um, you know, kind of we, we've seen this increase in smartphone usage at the same time, this decrease in social interaction, this decrease in doing things that increase competence and confidence, like getting driver's license, things like that. Have you been looking at any of that and, and pros to technology as well in terms of increasing connection in different ways, obviously, right. but, but any comments on that? And then the, the sub question to that is like parents tracking their kids on their phones and some of the parent behaviors that go along with, uh, you know, sending boundaries around phones. Um, it's a loaded question for a, for the, for a Q and a, but any thoughts on that? Well, it, it's literally, I don't think I've ever given a talk where one of the last couple of questions isn't about technology. I think that we are really, really struggling with this issue. Um, I also need to tell you that while I'm gonna answer the question, um, I'm not the leading expert on that. And what I'd love you to do, and, and if someone could look this up right now, um, but look up Michael Rich, um, Social Media Harvard, um, and his center, as I believe my center on parenting team communication is the leading thinker, but um, if you look up this Michael Rich Center, that's what has the best and uh, most current data that I would recommend. With that said, um, Jenna, you um, partially answered your question in the asking. Um, so you're right, this is about human connection and it is both positive and negative. So um, let's talk about the positives first. For a whole bunch of people who felt isolated, who felt bullied, um, the best thing that ever happened is social media. For our LGBT kids, for our trans kids who are living in environments where they didn't know anyone like them, knowing that they're not alone is literally life-saving. For our kids with rare diseases and chronic diseases, support groups are literally life-saving. Um, so um, at the same time, I worry tremendously, right? Um, communication has evolved um, over time and we just don't know what we're doing yet. Um, you know, it used to be that we all sat around um, and told stories. That was probably us at our healthiest as humanity, right? We learned from our elders, we learned from our neighbors, we visited, and we gained our community wisdom. There's nothing better. The problem is we also, um, if our family member um, got married um, and uh, moved uh, two states away, we anticipated receiving a letter from them um, uh, once every uh, two months. Um, Telephones came and allowed us to stay connected, but it also made us um, lose um, that reliance on the people right next to us. Um, then comes radio, then comes television. Now it's social media, because at least television we could watch together, social media we can all do ourselves. So here's the bottom line. We are not gonna turn back this. Oh, and the algorithms are absolutely dangerous and destructive to society. We're living in a deeply, deeply divisive time where people will get into their algorithmic rabbit holes. You say you like something and then you just begin getting more and more information from people like you, which radicalizes human beings and people are exploiting that. Within our own country, I think that there is evil that is exploiting this. And we know factually that um, the bots from um, countries that are trying to divide us are going in and trying to make us fight on social media. All of it is utterly terrifying to me. 
And I said during the time of uncertainty that, um, uh, that we have to really think about this because we're very vulnerable to misinformation. So what do we do? We talk to kids about the power of human connection. When we give kids our phones, we limit their use. We turn them off during certain times, um, like dinner and family outings. We turn them off and we do that as well. We don't let them stay up all night um, on the internet because we take their phones from them when they go to bed, right? To help them go to sleep. We also don't give our kids phones until you can look someone in the eye and go, sir or ma'am, I'm the person for the job. Because if you speak to kids in Generation Z, they find um, face-to-face -face conversations awkward. So we, we're not gonna take away social media, but we have to give forth um, human interaction and understand we have to double down on it. How's that for a very long answer? I think that's an excellent answer. I mean, and again, it, it's, it's one that obviously creates a lot of um, anxiety in all of us because it is where these kids are, are, they have so much uncertainty and they're being bombarded with un more and more uncertainty, environmental uncertainty, all sorts of things that we have to try and balance out. So that's great. I wanna make sure I hit another question. Um, how do you convince youth that have faced so many challenges beyond forming trust and relationships that vulnerability is indeed safe and valuable? By making them feel safe, right? So it can't be done in a conversation and it can't be done with a pat on the back, right? They have to actually experience it, right? They have to really experience that there's safety through human connection and that people can be worthy of trust. Um, just to be clear about what my head is. So, so I run the Center for Parent and Teen Communication. I'm the resilience guy for Boys and Girls Clubs of America, which I'm going to say is kind of, um, you know, young people who um, have, some of them have been made vulnerable by their environment. But I also want you to know that um, my primary affiliation is really with Covenant House. Um, so I work with kids who are deeply, deeply traumatized. And you cannot just talk at a kid and think that they're going to feel better. They have to have a lived experience that says that they're authentically safe. They have to be able to feel calm enough that their hormones stop firing and their neural pathways stop expecting the worst. Um, that takes time, it takes intentionality, um, and it takes repeated exposures to goodness, right? Um, so it's not about convincing people, because I don't think you can convince people with words. Um, I think it's about demonstration over time. Um, and when, you know, there's certain like speech lines I love to give, right? And um, one of them is, why do we love? so that young people know they're worthy of loved. And the other thing is, you know, why, um, uh, you know, that one of our mo the most effective things we can do is to help people learn that people can be worthy of trust. Because for the kids I take care of, they've all been abused, they've all been violated. And to be with a little man who really has nothing in mind but service and protecting you, it takes some time to get used to that. Um, but I think that sometimes the greatest gift I can give kids is to just have an experience with a human being who um, is really worth trusting. The The next question I was going to ask, and then we really have to shift over to, to CEs, which is kind of along that same line. When you're working with children who are in split families where the child is spending half the time in a home with a, a parent who is disengaged or negligent and the other half, you know, with a different kind of parent, whether that's, you know, kind of the more balanced parent or um, right. even an authoritarian parent. So there's some exposure to, to that, you know, sort of calming force that you're talking about, but then they kind of are, are they've whiplash. They're kind of going back and forth or, or with you, they get that, but then in home, they don't. Uh, so this is, this is never going to work, right? And so what is gonna work and what, what's gonna happen is that the kids are gonna pick and choose and the kids are often going to pick the parent that is most permissive. Cause on any given day, I'd rather have a chocolate sundae than do homework, right? Um, so you, the, um, you're advantaged to be a permissive parent. But what we have to do is speak to people's better selves and everybody wants to do what's right for their kids. And what we do mistakenly, I think, when we work with families, and you'll see, um, go to parentingteam.com. I saw the a question. I haven't been able to follow chat, but I saw that what just popped up was resources. If I'd love to be able to 
share some with you. A parent and teen is a good start. Um, the professional resource is reaching teens, but that's not free, right? But it's really not that expensive for what it is. It's a very comprehensive body of work. Um, but um, the um, what we want to do in all of these resources when we're trying to get parents is we have to start with their strengths. So um, go to um, parentingteen.com and see the articles about balanced parenting and see how we're trying to bring parents along. You can't say, you know, this uh, permissive parenting is very bad for you. You can't say to the authoritarian parent, you know, you're being over controlling and that's bad for kids because that literally has never worked. What you have to do is applaud people's strengths. So to the authoritarian parent, you say, you know, it's so wonderful that you care so much about knowing about what your child's doing. That is a real strength and they're lucky to have you be so involved in their lives. Did you know that kids actually um, will appreciate it a lot more if you just let them know that you're watching so closely because you love them? For the permissive parent, it's great that you honor, that you want to have a great relationship with your kids and that you trust their ability to learn lessons on their own. Did you know that they'll actually stretch further and take more chances if you create clear boundaries because it makes them feel safe? right? In other words, what I've done is built on the strength and try to move you towards the middle. Great, great answer. Um, I'm going to have uh, Micah wrap us up with how to get CEs. And Dr. Ginsburg, if there's any kind of place where you would direct people to get additional training that you want to pop in the chat, um, I know other folks are trying to figure out how do I get more. Uh, so feel free to do that. And Micah, thanks for telling people about CEs. Um, yes, thank I you. Um, I don't think I can functionally pop something in the chat. I mean, maybe I could do, I, I, I'm going to try, but if not, can I send it to you later and you'll send it out to people? Uh, yes, we should be able to do that. Okay. I'm just old. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Ginsburg. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today for our monthly webinar series. Uh, as always, I'm going to pop that chat there or pop that link in the chat again. And that link is going to take you back to your My Account page. Um, go ahead, log into your My Account page, and then you should see today's seminar uh, listed there with uh, a lit orange certificate button. If that certificate button is not lit, just wait about two hours. Uh, we're still taking attendance. Refresh, and then you should be able to complete your evaluation and print your certificate today. Uh, if for some reason it does not show within uh, that 24 hours, uh, again, just email us and we'll go ahead and get that uh, fixed for you as quickly as possible. Thank you again, everyone. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you're getting tons of thank yous and compliments in the chat. So thank you for uh, presenting today, Dr. Ginsburg. It was a very dynamic, impactful, with lots of actionable intel that folks can take forward and think about as they work with parents and as they work with teenagers. So thank you so much for participating or presenting in our series. Thanks for coming today for everybody who came. Look forward to hopefully having you come next month or to one of our other events. And we will be closing the room soon, mostly so that that tracking can start and you can get your CE. So thanks again. Thank you. It was a pleasure.